Well, yeah, it's a bit stretched, but uh, never mind. Let's not uh, waste any more time. Uh, so I'm Chaim Bidenkop from the Weizmann Institute. Uh, and I guess I'm the comic relief before Andre continues with his talk uh, after lunch. Uh, but I would like to tell you uh, about some of our experiments. So I have a scanning tiny microscopy lab uh, back in Weizmann. And uh, actually, topological materials have been a very uh, fascinating uh, chapter for us doing uh, surface science because of uh, bulk boundary correspondence. So we measure the uh, surfaces, the boundaries of samples. However, bulk boundary correspondence assures us or allows us to tell something about the bulk to topology just by looking on the surfaces of the materials and not only uh, surfaces, but nowadays uh, we can, and as I will show you, we can look on surfaces, on edges. While you were having uh, the discussion with Andre, uh, I even added the defects, which uh, I will address uh, in my uh, talk, um, and how they correspond to the bulk uh, topological classification or how the topological bulk classification induces interesting states uh, on these different uh, boundaries. Uh, of course, the reason for that is that these interesting uh, surface states can be realized only as the surface boundary termination of a topological bulk. So uh, you cannot realize uh, a Dirac uh, surface states, uh, helical Dirac surface states, without having a topologically insulating, topological insulator bulk or some other topological bulk phase. Uh, you cannot take a two deck and somehow manipulate it into a helical state, having a single helical Dirac band on the surface without having the bulk uh, doing it for you or allowing you to create, to break a fermion doubling and, and uh, induce a single helical band on the surface. So uh, what I uh, would like to do in the two hours that I have for this uh, topic is first of all um, show you which I think has a very interesting pedagogical value which addresses the school uh, aspect of this meeting uh, of uh, topological defects and uh, a very interesting and intuitive analogy between uh, topological defects and uh, topological electronic phases uh, and then in the second part I will actually use these uh, unique properties of topological defects in order to probe uh, topological properties of an electronic phase a uh, very interesting uh, uh, material that uh, uh, is being addressed in several experiments these days and has a certain ambiguity uh, regarding its uh, topological nature and the ground state, electronic ground state of this material. And this material is bismuth. So in this part, um, I will first show you the interesting spectroscopy that we find in bismuth and actually there seems to be very interesting uh, correlated ground states uh, which uh, are not related directly to topology but still may affect the topological uh, classification of the uh, electronic states in bismuth. And then uh, in the third part, I will kind of uh, merge these two topics together and show you how we can use uh, topological defects in, in specifically screw dislocation in order to uh, probe the topological classification of bismuth. And then in the last part, hopefully I'll have time uh, to reach it uh, in the second talk, I'll also show you how we uh, can now take the uh, uh, bismuth bilayers, which are the topological ingredient, and, and kind of engineer from them a different kind of topological class, which is a dual topological insulator. So that's the uh, plan uh, for my two uh, talks, today and tomorrow. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me uh, at every point. So uh, starting with the uh, topological defects, and I don't refer to these bugs in the presentation, um, but uh, first let's consider uh, a bulk uh, of a crystal. So here I'm schematically drawing two uh, bulk of crystal, cubic crystals. And then in one of them we can induce a topological defect, which you do by cutting this bulk, this crystal, halfway through. 
displacing it by, say, a single unit cell, or more than a single unit cell, and this is the uh, Burgers vector, which classifies the topological defect, and stitching the two uh, uh, half infinitely cut uh, parts back together. So on the surface, on this surface, we don't see any reminiscence of the, uh, this uh, 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 topological defect that we induced, but of course, somewhere in the bulk, we have a screw dislocation that we induced by this uh, procedure, which is characterized by this Burgers vector, which just counts how many unit cells we displaced uh, in the bulk. Now, what I, what I would like to show you is actually all the terminology that we know uh, from topological uh, electronic phases actually are realized also in topological uh, defects and give a very intuitive uh, uh, understanding uh, of, of, uh, of the origin of the interesting phenomena that we find in topological uh, materials. So, uh, first of all, we can uh, uh, draw a closed contour in the bulk. Uh, and of course, uh, if we do it in a material without the topological defect, uh, the contour goes back to itself if we follow bond by bond. If we do it uh, around the topological defect, we end up at a different uh, site in the unit cell, and this difference is exactly the Burgers vector. So uh, we can use this to kind of classify the bulk of the crystal by how many uh, uh, unit cell displacements, how many Burgers vector we have in the bulk of our material, and this would be the bulk classification of the material. You can have screw dislocation in an infinite crystal and classify how many screw dislocations uh, uh, you have in, in your material. So in this case, uh, we have zero. In this case, we happen to have one. Um, now let's introduce the surface. So uh, this is a surface of a trivial uh, material. Again, we can draw a closed contour and uh, it goes back to itself. And if uh, uh, we now can manipulate the surface by removing atoms from it, so this is kind of the surface perturbation that we can induce. And what we find is however we do the surface perturbation, we always end up with an even number of crossings of the uh, of steppages on the surface. There is no way we can manipulate the surface and have an odd number of uh, steppage crossing because we always remove a closed uh, a contour, kind of a, an island from the surface. This island can be a single atom or it can be several atoms, but because it's always a, a, an island which is bound by a circumference, we always uh, uh, add or remove an even number of uh, uh, crossings. Of course, there is a way to uh, induce an odd number of crossings, and this is to have a topological defect in the bulk. So if we introduce a surface on the uh, crystal that has a screw dislocation in it, we find that, and, and draw the closed contour on the surface, we indeed find that it uh, crosses a single step edge, and that's basically the only way to uh, uh, induce a step edge that terminates uh, at a point on the surface. So you can see there is uh, an even odd effect on the surface related to this mode, if you want, a crystallographic mode, this step edge, that terminates at a point on the surface. So uh, another way to uh, get this uh, Burgers vector without actually uh, 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 counting the crossings is that to calculate this uh, integral over the closed contour of the surface curvature, of the gradient of the surface uh, topography. If you do that, you uh, 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 integrate over the surface curvature along this closed uh, contour. Can I have uh, some water, please? Right there. Oh, perfect. Sorry. Just have a sip. Sorry. Um, right. So if I now uh, calculate this uh, closed integral along this path, I find exactly uh, the same uh, um, Burgers vector, the same topological index. And this is uh, um, uh, directly equivalent to the Berry phase that you have in topological phases. When you integrate over it, you find the topological index 
of a material, so I don't even have to know that I have a screw dislocation terminating on the surface. Even without looking to this point of termination, which is a very uh, um, strong perturbation, as we'll, show, we'll see next, to the crystal, even if I draw, the, draw this contour very far away from the uh, this termination point and just count how many steppages I have, I can tell whether uh, I, I have uh, uh, somewhere within this contour uh, topological defect that uh, terminates, and I can tell even what's the Berger's vector which is associated with it without knowing even which step edge actually is the one that um, uh, go, will go all the way down to the uh, screw dislocation. Um, so uh, there is an interesting bulk boundary correspondence in the sense that that's the only way to induce such a, an edge mode on the surface. And if you do find such an edge mode, you can know that somewhere in the bulk of the crystal, you have a screw dislocation, a topological defect. Now, these uh, uh, edge modes are unique to the surfaces of bulk materials, which are topological in the sense that they have a topological defects in them. Um, and uh, you can ask yourself how, how was I able, how was the crystal, how was chemistry uh, able to induce such a mode? Where is the other half of this step edge? And of course the answer is that the other part of this step edge is on the other facet of the uh, crystal. So if you introduce another surface termination on the opposite side and the screw dislocation ends also terminates on this bottom side, you will have kind of the counter part of this step edge uh, and then you kind of uh, uh, added the two odd step edges to uh, regain the uh, even property. And this is exactly what happens in topological electronic phases. In topological insulators, the reason uh, we have, uh, we are able to break fermion doubling and have a single helical mode on the surface of Fermi arcs on the surface of vile semi-metals is because the topological bar kind of removed one set of, of bands uh, from one surface and shifted them to the other surface of the material. And this is also what the screw dislocation does to this surface edge mode uh, uh, of the crystal. And this is uh, also what gives protection. So the fact that we have only a single helical mode on the surface uh, does not allow backscattering, uh, does not allow uh, localization. And this is why also if you have a screw dislocation, there is no surface perturbation that would remove uh, the screw dislocation, for sure, this is a bulk property, but there's no surface perturbation that will remove also this uh, unique topological surface mode, this step edge that terminates the odd uh, number of step edge crossings, because as, as we've seen in the trivial case, if I now uh, remove or add atoms, I, only, I can only add uh, an even number of such crossings. So uh, the fact that I was able to cut this step edge in two and re remove one half of it to the other surface means that if I want to now remove the surface manifestation of the topological defect, I would have to deal with the actual bulk classification, with the actual uh, bulk topological defect. And if I remove this defect, I will remove the surface uh, uh, um, manifestation of the bulk topology. So, uh, this is why topological defects are very robust. We cannot remove them by any surface treatment. We actually have to uh, uh, shrink them down to, uh, uh, on, on themselves to create a dislocation loops and shrink them down, which is the equivalent of closing the ball gap of an uh, electronic phase. Uh, so this is the uh, protection. And now let me uh, show you a first uh, STM image. Uh, so this is the topography of copper, uh, the 111 surf surface of uh, uh, copper. Uh, actually, uh, by now, even this surface mode has been uh, classified as topological. So it turns out, uh, although copper has a very small spin orbit uh, uh, coupling, turns out somewhere above the Fermi energy, there is a gap, and this gap is inverted and these uh, surface states uh, that we measure a lot, and this is not surface state, this is just the uh, topography, just the surface structure of the material, but uh, it hosts 
uh, even this host neither is uh, what is believed to be uh, topological surface states. But uh, I, I, what I want to show is more crystallographically at this point. Uh, I've hidden these two uh, uh, points on the, to on the surface. You can, of course, uh, guess or know why I did that. But let's just see that this, uh, all these considerations, of course, uh, uh, happen also in reality. So I draw a close contour on, on, in this part of the surface. I crossed an even number of steppages. And indeed, there's nothing uh, topological happening, uh, terminating within this contour. But if I do the same around this point, I cross a single uh, step edge, and indeed, when I uh, remove uh, the cloud, I see that there is a screw dislocation on that surface that terminates uh, at a point, and I didn't have even to visualize it in order to know that uh, it is there. So, um, what, uh, what happens to this step edge? Uh, if it cannot close on itself like most step edges do, what still happens to it? It, it goes on until it uh, meets a uh, screw dislocation of opposite chirality, which is very similar to Fermi arc uh, case, where you have two uh, vial nodes in the bulk of opposite chiralities, and then on the surface, you have an open contour mode, which is the Fermi arc, that goes from one chirality to the other chirality, and it's protected by the uh, chiral uh, uh, charge of the vial nodes. The same happens for this step edge. It will continue until uh, it hits a screw dislocation of opposite chirality or the edge of the sample if it happens first, which just means that then it will go down this mode on the side of, the, uh, sam of our sample and uh, below on the bottom surface of the sample. And it would uh, meet the other end of this screw dislocation, but if you look uh, instead of from uh, down up, from up down on the bottom surface, it indeed flips the chirality. So the only way this uh, edge mode, topological edge mode, can terminate is at the screw dislocation of opposite chirality. So what happens to this guy? We can um, follow uh, the step edge until we indeed end up at another screw dislocation that happens to have uh, an opposite chirality which also means that if we now draw a closed contour, we will again uh, cross an even number of uh, steppages, which is kind of uh, looking in the brilliant zone in a whale semi-metal outside the region bounded by the two uh, vial nodes. So uh, the uh, uh, topological charge uh, is, is now uh, back zero because I had two screw dislocations with opposite chiralities within this contour. This also shows you uh, very interestingly that uh, the contour of this uh, topological surface mode is not a topologically proper, uh, protected property. You see that there are trivial, as far as we know, there are trivial steppages that cross it in the middle, and once they do, uh, there's no sense of hybridization in, in uh, crystallography. But there's no way to tell if this uh, edge mode is actually uh, continuing, or there's no even sense of asking if this edge mode is continuing straight through, or actually it goes right, back, left, and to the uh, screw dislocation termination. Yes? Right, so, so this is the physics of, uh, of thermodynamics at uh, hundreds of Celsius. So this, this happens when the samples are grown and when they are quenched to room temperature and of course depends on the whole growth and quenching procedure. There are ways to uh, induce more of them. This is one of the best ways the crystal has to uh, relieve uh, strain. So if you grow it on a, a misfit surface, you will induce uh, many screw dislocations. Um, but it's a very high energy uh, object. So um, in principle, you can manipulate it. I don't know anyone that uh, ever did. This is all single versus that you're talking about? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Can you say what is the size of that stuff? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I should have. There is no scale. There is no scale, right. 
uh, sorry, the, these stepages are single atomic uh, layers on the surface uh, of a single crystal copper, which means this is about two angstrom high. Uh, and these dark points, for example, that you see here, and this is the uh, vertical scale. The dark points that you see here are single molecules of uh, carbon uh, monoxide. So this is the scale of a single atom. I don't remember actually the size of it, but it's few tens or hundred or of nanometers uh, across. So yeah, these, these are single atomic uh, steppages in copper. Yes? Well, it depends on the material. So bismuth we cleave, uh, that I'll show you later. Copper we treat. Uh, so we have a single crystal, which is high, polished to very high accuracy by some company, and then we sputter anneal it. So we, um, we destroy the surface by sputtering, bombarding it with the argon ions. Uh, it removes the dirt from the surface, but also uh, uh, degrades the quality of the surface. So we anneal it and allow the atoms to diffuse and recrystalline uh, the surface. But of course, this is because this is only, I mean, we do it at a temperature which allows only surface diffusion. So nothing happens to the screw dislocations, which are bulk uh, defects. But if you warm more, yeah, they would also become mobile. It's like a quasi particle, uh, which is at zero temperature for all practical purposes uh, in, in room temperature. Any more questions before I proceed? Yes. Mm. Well, um, copper is a very common uh, material in STM because we use it to prepare our tip. So every time before we start an experiment, we put in a single crystal of copper and we prepare our tip uh, for the measurement. Um, so uh, the reason many use copper 111 is because it has a surface state. Um, what was thought to be and commonly thought still as a trivial uh, Taman surface states, but actually there's a paper that claims that it's a topological surface state, but it doesn't matter. There is a surface state and we use it in order to image, to, to test the quality of the tip before we move on to the actual experiment. So this is why we, we and many other groups uh, measure copper 111 uh, quite often. Right. So, um, right, so I just wanted to add uh, that you can see also that the, which is an interesting observation that goes through also to vile semi-metals, that the connectivity of the surface modes between the uh, surface projection of the uh, topological bulk is not uh, really protected. It's, it really depends on the uh, properties of the surface and not on the classification of the bulk. We just know that somewhere among these uh, steppages, there is one, which is not even unique, uh, that connects this point to that point. And the same is true uh, in, uh, for Fermi arcs. So you can always add a trivial band, hybridize it with a Fermi arc band, and get a new Fermi arc with a, a different uh, contour on the surface. Same happens also uh, uh, with screw dislocation. So um, I find it very uh, intuitive, uh, this uh, analogy. Um, so I thought it would be nice to uh, introduce it here. But as I told you before, we are going also to use it in order to uh, probe the topological electronic classification of materials. And there, are, there is actually quite a, a large body of works that addresses uh, what uh, happens electronically uh, on screw dislocations at, in topological materials, or not just uh, screw dislocation, it could be other topological defects. We uh, uh, detected mainly uh, screw dislocations, so I will focus on screw dislocations. Um, so I, I think, as far as I know, and this was really in the beginning of the topological uh, era, 
uh, the, the first and one of the most influential works uh, that addressed it is this work uh, that uh, looked at topological screw dislocations in weak topological insulators and found that the, uh, the, uh, they indeed bind uh, helical mode on the screw dislocation. So the uh, screw dislocation is kind of another type of termination that, of boundary that you can uh, consider uh, with respect to the topological properties of the material. We have the bulk, we have the two-dimensional surfaces, we can have uh, hinges or corners, uh, um, which are the one-dimensional object, steppages, which are actually made of two hinges. Uh, we will see them a lot later, but all these steppages uh, is another type of boundary. And uh, the defect is itself, this one-dimensional object, is uh, another kind of one-dimensional, truly one-dimensional boundary that you can consider with respect with uh, its uh, spectroscopic uh, electronic properties. And of course, as we've said before, it has to connect with the step edge uh, on the surface termination. So it mixes very interestingly uh, the bulk and the surface. Uh, and actually, these step edges that we talked about before that can be uh, a single unit cell, the Burgers vector, as, as you know, can can be of a larger value. So when I cut my crystal halfway through and, and displace it, I don't have to stop after one unit cell, uh, at least theoretically, I can uh, shift it by how many uh, uh, unit cells I choose to. Um, this, of course, costs a huge amount of energy, but still, uh, in principle, it could be done if you go to high enough temperature. Um, which, which means that this steppage is actually the most uh, minimal case of a side surface that we introduce. You can think of inducing a screw dislocation with a larger Burgers vector, which will kind of open up a new side uh, surface uh, on this uh, trivial surface of the material. And this steppage is basically this, uh, the minimal size of this side surface. Uh, and I'm saying all of this because actually you can think of this step edge, or you should think of it, not really as a 1D object, but as a two-dimensional surface which has to terminate at the truly one-dimensional object, which is the axis of the screw dislocation. So it also mixes in a very interesting way the dimensionality of uh, side surfaces, hinges, which are the, these corners of these uh, step edges, and uh, one dimensionality of the uh, screw dislocation uh, axis. So uh, all of these will uh, uh, play together uh, in the rest of the talk. And uh, slightly later, uh, there was this paper that uh, generalized the, the claim put forward by, uh, uh, in this uh, first paper from uh, Ashwin Vishwanath's group. Um, and, and came up with this more general argument or condition for uh, when do we expect to find uh, helical mode uh, at uh, screw dislocation. So these three uh, indices here are the weak indices of, uh, of a material. And this is the Burgers vector. And whenever this dot product is uh, non-zero or non-zero mod 2 pi, uh, we would uh, expect to get uh, a helical mode bound to the uh, screw dislocation. And of course, this is what happens at the weak topological insulator, which is exactly where we have these uh, weak indices being uh, non-zero. And there's a later review, uh, which is this one, that really addresses uh, what we know to date about the uh, correspondence between uh, topological defects and uh, um, topological uh, electronic phases. Okay, so with this, I, I ended the, the first part of the talk. If there are any more questions, be happy to take them now. And if not, uh, I'll move to uh, Bismut. Um, so, Bismut has been an interesting material forever. Uh, but more, more recently, 
uh, both with respect to uh, topo its topological properties and with respect to its uh, electronic ground states, regardless of five minutes? Oh. Five minutes. True. OK. So I'll just uh, start with a kind of general introduction to bismuth. And in the next lecture, we will probe it with uh, uh, our topological defect. But today, we can understand at least the ambiguity. So uh, on the topological side, which is the left side of the screen, uh, it was, of course, maybe I should start with this work. Uh, our first three-dimensional uh, topological material, uh, which was bismuth antimony, uh, bismuth alloyed with 7% uh, or more of uh, antimony, uh, which turned, kind of turned bismuth uh, into being a three-dimensional strong topological insulator. Um, um, actually, even before that, uh, there was a prediction by Murakami, uh, even in the days of the two-dimensional topological insulators, uh, that uh, a bilayer of bismuth would be a realization of a quantum spin hole insulator, a two-dimensional uh, uh, two uh, insulator. Uh, and indeed, in this work, uh, and many of these works uh, are from uh, Ali Azdani's uh, uh, lab, uh, which is uh, doing STM and has very beautiful STM works uh, on bismuth. Uh, so uh, in this work, they uh, claimed and saw that uh, indeed uh, bilayers of bismuth, which just reside on top of bulk bismuth, uh, behave as a uh, two-dimensional two topological insulator, basically, with some uh, minute complications. But they've seen the uh, kind of the helical mode that you would expect to see on the side facets of uh, uh, um, to the uh, topological insulator. So this is uh, the first report. And more recently, um, and I think by now I need to update this reference, right? It was published. Um, so more recently, uh, bismuth was considered as a higher order topological insulator, uh, which uh, gives a, a different interpretation, uh, in some sense more, uh, uh, less uh, pathological to the, this interesting occurrence of uh, helical modes on these tappages. So what you see here in these two images, which are uh, uh, the same, but uh, interpreted differently nowadays, is uh, an increased density of states that uh, was measured on steppages on the surface of bismuth. And these are uh, interpreted as the hinge modes uh, of a higher order of bismuth being a higher order topological insulator, but uh, it can uh, very well be the helical modes of the 2D topological insulating uh, bilayer of bismuth. Now, in principle, I think both uh, scenarios can be considered. Uh, you can find convincing argument for this one and con uh, convincing argument for that one, and this is what we will try to uh, address by uh, measuring a screw dislocation in bismuth. So have a few more minutes for this side. So this is the uh, ambiguity in the topological aspects of bismuth. So it can be a two-dimensional topological insulator. Now, bismuth is made of bismuth bilayers. So maybe it can be a weak topological insulator. This is our recipe to uh, build a weak topological insulator is take a 2 DTI and stack it. Maybe it's a weak topological insulator, maybe it's a higher order topological insulator, maybe it's trivial, and only when we add antimony, it turns into uh, something truly topological. So this is the ambiguity we will try to address or add some, a bit more information to. And here on this side, you see a very uh, intricate ground states that, uh, we are now starting to see in STM. So again, these are all works, and there are by now I think three different uh, papers uh, that uh, from Ali's lab that looked on uh, um, different correlated uh, states on the surface of bismuth. Uh, so a nematic phase, which is found on the surface, and uh, uh, um, a very polarized phase, which is found on the surface. Uh, and all of these were measured at a high magnetic field, uh, 
and uh, I will show you what we find at zero magnetic field. So kind of just to give you a taste of the uh, complexity and interest uh, that uh, we find on bismuth also in terms of the interacting uh, ground states that uh, the electrons uh, seem to assume. So all of this, I guess, will be tomorrow. Great. Tomorrow. Oh, on copper. Uh, okay. Uh, we did it on copper. Uh, so the, the screw dislocation induces a very large uh, strain. Uh, you, th this is the largest strain I think you can induce. So of course there are um, uh, spectral differences or evolution as you go closer and closer uh, to the screw dislocation. We didn't study them carefully, but I think basically um, you can change the spectroscopy of your material dramatically. You could, in principle, induce even topological phases around the screw dislocation just by, if you choose the right material, I'm not sure copper is the right one, but uh, the spectrum definitely evolves as you go radially towards the screw dislocation. So um, you will see, you, you will get a very complicated picture. We know, for example, in bismuth that the screw dislocation is also a scatter. It's, it scatters the electrons. So you will see in the Fourier transform, you will see some uh, standing wave pattern that comes from the dispersion of, of the electrons. Now, it could be the, also that because of the strain that the dispersion evolves radially, so it won't be just the bare spectrum that you'll see in the Fourier transform, but actually some kind of uh, stretch oscillating behavior as the wavelength evolves radially away from the screw dislocation. Um, I think there's a lot to look for, and you just need somehow to dice your data right in order to try and isolate uh, um, each behavior separately, which is what we try to do in bismuth. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely changes the spectrum of the electrons too.